is shorter. Hello, everybody. How are you guys? Come on. How are you guys? All right. I'm stoked you're here. So my name is Dana Boyd, um, and I am the founder of Data and Society. I'm also a partner researcher at Microsoft Research. And it is my sincere pleasure to invite all of you here tonight um, to Data and Society um, for our Data Byte with Joe Mole Hall from Hope Not Hate. So before we begin, how many of you have ever been to Data and Society before? How many of you have never been here before? The opposite, yeah, look, at welcome. So the thing is, now you're here, you know this is a place for you, these are all sorts of great and interesting people, as you are always welcome back. So I wanna point out Audrey, um, who has got the best outfit ever today, um, because she's who you should be lined for after this, make certain that you're on our lists and you know how to come back to different kinds of events. Um, because what we are as a research institute is we're really trying to bring together um, you know, practitioners and researchers and to build a knowledge base that will ground a lot of the hardest conversations that we're having at the intersection of data and society. So I want to begin tonight by acknowledging um, the, the Lenape community, um, because that's whose land uh, we are gathered on. So we acknowledge the uh, ways in which, as uh, you know, people living in New York City, we are actually living on indigenous land. Um, and there are communities that were here long before we were here. So that acknowledgment and the purpose of acknowledging the land that we stand on today is to uh, work to dismantle a lot of the legacies of settler colonialism and to really think about what that means in a contemporary environment. So so as you stand in this land, make certain to take time to think about what your uh, responsibility is to um, address the inequities of, uh, that, that history has brought with us today. So as we welcome the people to the front row, so you welcome to the front row. That's what you get for coming late. Um, but we love you anyhow, and we're glad you're here. Um, some very basic housekeeping. Um, at some point, you may need to go to the bathroom. That's totally acceptable. There are two bathrooms. They kind of require you going around the corner uh, behind the kitchen. Um, and uh, you have uh, the ability there will be snacks and drinks afterwards, so please make sure to stick around. The other thing to note is that tonight's talk is being live streamed um, and transcribed. It will be available. Uh, afterwards too. So thinking about that as you might ask questions um, or uh, you know thinking about that is if you really love this it means it's an opportunity to share it with people, tell people about what's happening. Okay, so I'd like to take uh, the moment now to introduce Joe Mulhall. So he is a senior researcher at Hope Not Hate, which is the UK's largest anti-fascism and anti-racism organization. He is a historian of post-war and contemporary fascism. He completed his PhD at Royal uh, Holloway and the University of London. He sits on the board of the UK government-funded Holocaust uh, Memorial Tr uh, Day Trust in the UK. And he has uh, published extensively both academically and journalistically, um, and he has two forthcoming uh, books, right? Because you can't just do one, you gotta do two. That's an overachiever problem. Um, but we're really excited in particular um, about ones coming out in February called The Alt-Right, Fascism for the 21st Century. Um, and today he's going to share some of his uh, new research with us. So please, let's welcome uh, Joe. <laughs> let's do that there. Um, hello. Turn that up there. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I, I should start by thanking Dana and Data and Society for putting this all on and hosting it. It's it's very exciting. Um, I also need to thank Melissa, um, who's the editor of Control or I Delete, the newsletter, um, who's put a lot of work into this as well. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, as Dana said, I'm I'm from London. I'm from an organisation called Hope Not Hate, and we're the United Kingdom's largest anti-racism, anti-fascism organisation, and we do research on both domestic but also the international far right and hate groups more generally. And I'm here to talk about something that we've become remarkably passionate about and interested in in the last few years, and that's the kind of nexus where we see the crossover between the international far right and the issue of climate change, and, and more specifically climate denial and environmentalism. I remember a few years ago, we were kind of in a pub in Westminster, kind of next to the Houses of Parliament in London, and there's a group of researchers from Hope Not Hate, some scholars of the far right, some publishers, and we were sitting around and just having a chat saying kind of what's the big threat going forward as a movement for us? And everyone's put out the usual things, you know, the rise of the radical right in Europe, terrorism, you name it, the, th the sorts of things we always kind of talk about. And then someone piped up and said, I think it's clearly climate change. And there was a kind of little laughter through the room. Um, not that we didn't think climate change was important, but we didn't necessarily instantly see what it had to do with us as anti-racism or anti-fascist researchers. Um, 
It soon became clear after a brief conversation that we were hugely behind on this issue. And then speaking to lots of my colleagues and researchers looking at similar things as I was around the world, we were all having the same realization, quite how far behind we were at looking at the importance of these two issues coming together. So what I'm going to talk a little bit today is what I see as the threats on this linking between the radical right and the far right around the world and white supremacists and the issue of climate change, climate denial. And I'll essentially break it into three, which I'll briefly run through and then kind of talk about some of the challenges. And then I want to finish with some polling we've done across eight countries around the world on the issue of climate change, climate denial, misinformation, kind of conspiracy theories more generally, which I think is a nice place to wrap up, if a touch depressing. So I think what the first of these three things I think that we need to be looking at in terms of the radical right and climate change and environmentalism. The first is, of course, the threat of the radical right in power. Um, that sounds very obvious, but specifically in this issue. If we look at Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, one might argue Trump in North America. If we look at Modi in India, if we look across the continent of Europe, we're facing all sorts of problems, whether or not that's the alternative for Deutschland in Germany, um, whether or not that's the Front National, or formerly called the Front National in France, the Swedish Democrats in Sweden, uh, Law and Justice in Poland, Liga in Italy, Vox in Spain, um, Orban in Hungary, can look at the list goes on. In the United Kingdom, we have, of course, now the Brexit Party, formerly uh, or led by Nigel Farage, formerly of UKIP, that won uh, the largest number of votes in the last European election in terms of seats. Um, we are going through an epoch of a rising radical right across the international scene. And this causes a, a large number of issues when it comes to the issue of climate change uh, and climate denial. So what are they? Well, there's a couple of issues to this. Firstly, it's not quite as simple as one might think at first, the idea that the radical right or the far right deny climate change. It's far more complex than this. In fact, actually, most of them don't, or many of them don't. There's a huge range of perspectives that we have to look at here. So the success of radical right parties and leaders around the globe ranges from what you can talk as outright climate change denial all the way through to kind of localism or through to actually accepting climate change as very, very important and seeking to exploit that issue. But what there is a commonality is a sense that the liberal left political mainstream and populists, um, they are railing against these globalist elites. What Cass Mude talks about is the kind of pure people and the corrupt elite. And this is something we see across many of these parties. And climate change often fits in for many of these as part of that kind of elitist metropolitan politics. Some ways you've seen changes within the radical right on this issue. Trump's an interesting example. If you look at how he's changed in recent years from outright denial to some sort of kind of weaponized ambiguity, if you might. Um, in 2012, he tweeted, the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese to make US manufacturing non-competitive, which was an interesting take, um, considering most of what people say. But by 2008, that had changed to, he says, I will not deny climate change, but it could very well go back, whatever that means. So what we're talking about here is a range of different perspectives from the radical right on the issue of climate change. Some accept political consensus or scientific consensus. However, one thing that we do see generally across the movements is that even if they do accept it, they often step in the way of political change on the issue, often based for various reasons around economic political reasons. So even the ones that do accept man-made climate change will often stand in the way, which becomes increasingly important for this notion of the far right and the radical right in power. When we look at the European Parliament elections this year, we have radical right parties or far right parties uh, with huge numbers of votes, kind of it, it seats for about 25%, one might argue. This causes huge problems when attempting to cause change on the issue, not least because radical right parties oppose transnational collaboration often and multilateral agreements, which they can consider to impede national sovereignty. These are the things we're going to need to deal with climate change on a transnational and global scale, and these are the parties that are going to stand in the way of them. So I see there's kind of being two problems with the radical right in power on this issue. One is we have active climate, climate deniers in power, and the second part is we have people and parties which will stop change even if they do believe in it. So just to run through a few, I mean, the AFD is a good example of this. The AFD in Germany has become growing in success over, a year, uh, over the last few years, five years or so, um, in many of the German parliaments now. Um, unprecedented votes that we would not have expected to see a breakthrough like that in Germany. Their election uh, in the European Parliament this year ran on a position of save diesel. 
um, which is a generally unpopular position in Europe, but, uh, and it wasn't particularly successful for them in some ways. Um, but it became a huge issue for them, partly because climate change was a huge issue in Germany. AFD Facebook posts mentioned climate change 930 times in the last 12 months, compared to 75 times in the year from April to 2016. Um, of course, we have Trump, climate denial quite often, or at least per, to pulling out the Paris Agreement. In Brazil, we've seen statements regarding the unfounded alarm over climate change was threatening Brazil's sovereignty. Uh, in France, however, we've seen something slightly different. Under the Le Pen has talked about eco-nationalist responses to climate change, promoting green policies, but on the basis of nationalist and conservative interests. I think there's just to tease out a few issues about how the far right do deny climate change, because sometimes it seems quite strange uh, to, to normal people that you could just outright deny it. But it is, of course, slightly more nuanced than that. I think we can look at possibly about three ways in which they deny climate change. You, of course, have denialists who reject the scientific consensus. You have denialist parties and those that express some skepticism to climate change. And then you have those who are supportive of mainstream science. However, if you take that down, you can become more nuanced. You have trend skeptics who doubt the evidence for climate change. You have attribute skeptics who doubt the human cause for climate change. You have impact skeptics who doubt that climate change will be serious. And you have policy skeptics who question the solutions to climate change. The tactics they use are multifaceted to do these things. Um, I won't run through them all now. Of course, you have to look at things like links to agribusiness in Bolsonaro's case, um, the Koch brothers in North America funding these sorts of things, traditional misinformation campaigns. One thing I wanted to highlight, though, in this area is one thing that we're increasingly seeing as societal consensuses, especially in the general West, become ever clearer around the issue of climate change in terms of accepting it's being man-made. We're seeing a tactical shift by the radical right, moving from outright denial of the science, which is deeply unpopular and hard to win, to what we might call in England attacking the man, not the ball, in a football sense, um, going after the scientists, or the perfect example of this is, of course, going after Greta. Um, in the AFD, for example, she was mentioned 384 posts by AFD accounts in March and 243 last month, oh, sorry, in, in April, sorry, according to research by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. This allows parties, by going after these individuals rather than science, they try to use it to paint climate change as irrational, hysterical, panic, cult-like, and even a replacement religion. So that's part one, is the dangers and problems of having the far right in power and the effects they can have. But I actually think there's a, a couple more. The second one, I think, is how the far right will have an ability to exploit the issue of climate change, not just deny it. Here, we might talk about resource nationalism, but we will also talk about the effects of increased climate migration. Um, the last few years in Europe have been quite difficult in terms of the far right, partly because of their exploitation of the migrant crisis. There's many, many causes for the rise of the radical right, but one of them has been the res their response and the societal response to the migrant or the so-called migrant crisis. Um, right now, the push factors for migration across the Mediterranean, for example, but climate change is not anywhere near the top of that list. We talk about economics, we talk about war and conflict. Um, Climate-induced migration still remains down the list, and when it does happen, it re primarily remains kind of regional rather than transcontinental. However, that might not continue to be the case moving forward. We're likely to see an increase in trans-border and transcontinental migration caused by the issue of climate change. One person we spoke to was a guy called Steve, Stephen Trent, who runs the Environmental Justice Foundation, and he argues that it's absolutely clear that the numbers involved, even if we went to net zero emissions tomorrow, are going to be in the order of tens of millions and possibly hundreds of millions. These people are not going to head south, they are going to head north. So the radical right are in the perfect position to exploit this increased migration from the global south to the west. The danger is that rather than denying climate change, they will spread fear about climate-induced migration and push xenophobic and reactionary policies such as closing borders and building walls. Here there is a very difficult position for us uh, and a conversation for or an answer I do not have to this question is how we tackle this issue. How do we discuss large-scale migration, especially across the Mediterranean, without feeding directly into the hands of those individuals on the far right who will seek to weaponize it? I don't have the answer to this question, but it's certainly one we need to be having, we need to be discussing. And then the third thing in terms of the far right and climate change, um, what are, what, what's the third threat? Well, I think that this one's uh, dangerous is, of course, eco-fascism, something that we've seen a kind of raft of newspaper articles ranging from the awful to the OK. Um, both the Christchurch Tutor and some very good ones, I hasten to add, in case you're in the room. Um, 
both, both Christchurch Shooter in New Zealand and, of course, El Paso in Texas voiced concerns for environmental issues and framed their murderous hate crimes as solutions. The marriage of racist reactionary politics and environmentalism stretches back to the genesis of the study of ecology itself, of course. Online white nationalist forums nowadays, those of you who spend time on them, unfortunately, will see propaganda produced by things like the so-called eco-gang, referencing a mystical connection to the land, the violent enforcement of animal rights, the danger of overpopulation, and uh, looming ecological collapse. While this propagandizing remains niche at present, Eco-fascist ideas have roots in the dogma, of course, of the Third Reich uh, and notions of land, etc., and have been brought into sharp contrast by things like Christchurch, just how dangerous they are. For self-identifying eco-fascist blood and soil remains the key tenant and is discernible when the, uh, the gunman from Christchurch claimed the natural environment of our land shaped us just as we shaped it. We were born from our lands and our own culture was molded by these same lands. His vision of a, uh, rescuing Europe from perceived decline was also couched in really interesting anti-urban terms. He talked about the Europe of the future is not of concrete and steel, smog and wires, but of a place of forests, lakes, mountains and meadows. The doctrine frames the urban and industrial aspects of modernity as an attack on the white race, presents Jews and immigrants as parasites and invaders, and elevating the gutter prejudices and violent impulses of eco-fascists to a sacred mission to defend one's spiritual home, and turning mass murders into martyrs for a higher purpose. So there I think we have the three kind of core elements in terms of the danger the far right offer when it comes to the issue of climate change. But there's a huge amount of challenges that it faces, we face as researchers on this issue. Some of them are very obvious. We can't just look at the far right because it's easy and say climate change denial is caused by this small niche group of far right activists and if we deal with them we'll be fine. We've seen time and time again mainstream political actors around the world have been often the ones that are really stopping change on this issue. Maybe that's another conversation. It's also important we don't conflate environmentalism and climate change. Many of the individuals we monitor on the far right have very strong environmental platforms. Their solutions might somewhat differ to mine. but. Um, they different, they, but they still might also deny climate change. These things are complex. Um, we've seen some examples in Europe of campaigns like anti-wind farm campaigns by the far right, couched in environmental terms, talking about protecting birds, protecting the scenery, protecting the lands and the hills, um, and of course traditional kind of blood and soil notions. However, I think there's some more important challenges that we have to really look at. And this came out, I was in Lund uh, in Sweden a couple of weeks ago at a conference, Ecologies of the Far Right, and it was brilliant. It had researchers from all over the world there talking about this issue. And one of the things I noticed was a lot of the researchers were people that spent their time looking at environmentalism and had started to look at the effect of the far right, or people like myself that were looking at the far right and, and kind of racist politics and were starting to look more at environmentalism. And both of us were making mistakes that within our own fields we'd tried to deal with over many years. So, the first thing I'd say is we need to go beyond the uh, political manifestos of the, these political parties. Quite often when we say what, does the, what do these actors uh, believe on climate change, we as researchers look at their manifestos. Uh, the far right doesn't often operate like this. There's often a huge divergence between what they're saying in their you know, manifest, manifesto and what their core activists actually believe. So we have to get beyond that. That involves huge amounts of monitoring and research, um, kind of esoteric, exoteric, front of house, back of house, getting beyond the public declarations. This is especially important on this issue. Polling, as I'll come on to, is relatively clear about climate change as being a major issue for most people in society. And therefore, for a far right political party, continuing with climate change denial is not a vote winner. But just because they might change it in their manifesto doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do anything in power, as we've seen. But I think we also need to go beyond political parties. We need to look at movements. We need to look at far right and racist movements, whether or not that's things like the identitarians we've seen causing waves over the last decade in Europe. Their campaign against the UN Migration Compact is a good example of not a political party, not engaging in voting or elections, but still affecting change. Eco-terrorists would be another example of this. So going beyond political parties and looking at political movements. But we also need to go, I think, actually beyond political organizations altogether. I think if we look at the nature and the makeup of the contemporary far right around the world, we're increasingly seeing a decentralized, uh, not formally organized mass of activists, sometimes thousands, hundreds of thousands around the world, engaging in politics, but not through organizations, not through membership. They're offering micro donations of time, energy, effort, money, and they could be anywhere in the world. 
we have to, if we're going to understand how these things are affecting climate change policies, it's not just looking at what the Front National says and what the AFD says. We have to look at what these thousands of activists are saying because they have impact. And finally, tied into this, we have to go beyond the nation. We can't just look at our individual country or what does this country say or what does that country say. One of the fundamental um, nature of the contemporary far right is it is a transnational movement which means that someone sat in London can be looking at content denying climate change in North America, or someone in Australia could be sitting there looking at content produced in Germany. If we all just look at our own national context, we're going to miss a huge chunk of this picture. Two of the biggest climate change deniers or far-right figures in the United Kingdom, Paul Joseph Watson and a guy called Colin Robertson or Millennial Woes, have both denied climate change in the UK. But of course, their videos are only 20% viewed in the UK. So this is something we need to come on. We need to go beyond the nation. So how do we kind of deal with some of these things? So this kind of brings us on to some of this polling we've been doing. We were attempting to take a more international perspective on this phenomenon. And we wanted to look at how it is that you know, both the far right deny climate change, but how these uh, climate change denial works. So in short, what do people who deny climate change believe other than climate change denial? So we polled at least over 1,500 people in eight separate countries in Brazil, the US, Canada, Poland, Germany, Italy, France, and the United Kingdom. We sought to gauge opinion on climate change as well as climate denial ahead of the UN Climate Summit in New York during late September. So what did we find? I'm going to briefly run through uh, some of the key findings. Seven of the eight countries polled said that climate change was seen as the most important issue facing the world today. Sorry to say that it was the United States was the uh, exception there. Um, that said, though, um, uh, terrorism was viewed as the most uh, biggest issue here, or affordable health care, which, you know, is fair enough on the second. Um, the overwhelming majority of people thought that the world is facing a climate emergency. Three quarters, 74% believed that in the United Kingdom, 89% in Italy. Um, the US had the lowest number, but even here, over two thirds, 67% uh, felt that was the case. Uh, few people anywhere felt that governments were doing enough to tackle climate change. Uh, over half, 54% in Britain felt this, compared to 23% who believed it. And the gap was even larger in Italy, where 68 believed their government was not doing enough, and just 8% thought it was. In Germany, Poland, France, and Brazil, over 60% of people felt their governments were not doing enough. Um, and opinion was more divided in Canada, with 48% believing that. Um, so there's some good news in all of this. You know, I usually get to go over and depress everyone, but this, there's some good news here. Um, However, interestingly, kind of tying back into what I was talking about earlier, awareness that climate change could cause increased migration. So half of Britons believe that migration into Europe and North America will increase. And as a result of climate change, just compared to 13% who didn't think it would, in Italy and France, this figure rises to 66%, with just 10% disagreeing. Some interesting things popped out. There was surprisingly little difference in attitudes across age boundaries which is maybe me being ageist, I'd kind of presumed would be the case, but it didn't. At most, young people in a few of the countries polled were marginally more concerned about climate change than those who were over 65, but this was not the case everywhere. In Germany, for example, slightly more over 65s felt strongly that Europe was facing a climate emergency than young people. Um, but while age wasn't a major factor in kind of differentiating it, um, income and economic insecurity was. Generally, people on lower incomes were slightly less convinced about the dangers of climate change and certainly more resistant to the idea that economic growth needed to be curbed to reduce carbon emissions. I guess this isn't particularly surprising. But it also shows some interesting things when we talk about the poli wider policy platforms of the far right and their successes. Of course, quite often they're targeting these same economically deprived communities. Another element of the poll we wanted to understand was who was skeptical, and this is the really juicy bit, and who was unconvinced by climate change, and of course, why. So over a quarter of Brazilians, 26%, and more than a fifth of Americans, 22%, did not believe that global warming was happening at all. Um, I think these numbers are pretty staggering. I don't know if people agree. I just kind of presume that that didn't happen anymore, <laughs> but it does. Um, Roughly the same number of people in Germany, Canada, France, and Poland agreed um, with the British that climate change was happening, though not because of humans. Put together, of the third of people who believed that the threat of climate change was being exaggerated, 45% believed some form of climate denial conspiracy. And this is the really interesting bit if we're looking at the links here and the crossovers with the radical right. Climate change deniers believe in all sorts of other conspiracies as well, some of which, of course, chime with wider far-right politics.
Our polling confirmed a clear correlation between those who did not believe in climate change or that humans were not responsible for it and a belief in other conspiracy theories and anti-establishment ideas. Those with the most strident views on denying the human involvement in climate change had very unorthodox views on a range of controversial issues. Two-thirds of Italians who denied that humans were responsible for climate change believed that Jewish people had an unhealthy control over the world's banking system. It's kind of traditional far-right anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. A staggering 85% of British climate change deniers think that the threat of climate change is being exaggerated by governments in order to control how we live our lives. This again feeds into traditional populist radical right rhetoric around corrupt elites not looking out for the people. Conspiracy theories about these, not, they're not always conspiracy theories, there are some corrupt elites, but um, over 45% of climate deniers in Brittany, Britain, Germany, Italy and Brazil think that the 1969 moon landing was uh, staged. One of the more, I mean in some senses I kind of think that's quite funny, but some of these conspiracies of course are not funny. One of the more alarming views is that the CIA and the Israeli intelligence service Mossad helped set up ISIS. Over 60% of German climate change deniers believe this, as do 55% of British and Italian climate deniers and even 42% of American deniers. We also saw a strange correlation or a strong correlation in some countries with Islamophobia in these communities. British climate deniers have the most negative attitudes to Muslims and Islam amongst all eight countries. Three quarters of those who deny climate change in Britain that we polled felt that there were Sharia law and no-go zones across large parts of Europe. Again, a traditional far-right talking point about no-go zones where police can't go, Sharia law rules. Um, and these are quite popular positions in large parts of Europe. So where do we conclude here? I think there's a number of things to wrap up, just to make sure I'm exactly on the 20 minutes. Um, there appears to be a correlation between climate denial and other conspiracy theories. This includes racist and xenophobic conspiracies. The rise of the radical and far right around the world poses huge challenges to dealing with the issues of climate change. They sometimes deny it, which is one problem, but they often stop effective change in legislation, which is another. The one thing I think is various different movements, whether or not we're anti-racist movements, climate change movements, migration movements, one thing we have to be extraordinarily vigilant about is the co-option of this issue by the international far right. If perhaps it's more important than just fighting climate denial. Whether or not that is things like eco-terrorism, whether or not that is legitimizing xenophobic policies, whether or not it is resource nationalism. And as researchers, I say, we must go beyond the political parties, beyond the manifestos, beyond the movements, beyond the organizations, and go beyond nations. So societies faced with economic insecurity, real or perceived competition for resources, pressurized public services, and rapid social and cultural change can rapidly become disenfranchised, especially if faced by unresponsive politicians who offer no hope. In these situations, diversity can stop merely being difference and instead become division, a situation that provides fertile ground for those who wish to break apart our shared identities, scapegoat and replace them with an us and them siege mentality. We have found that these groups are already capitalizing on the issue of climate change, with climate denial and climate conspiracies having found a welcome home in the ideology of both the populist and far right. The war-driven migrant crisis in 2015 showed how quickly and powerfully anti-immigrant feelings can distort and destabilize politics, surging far beyond any initial racial, religious, and cultural friction. One million migrants arrived in a single year, and it had a massive impact on the politics of Europe. It undermined the credibility of Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel and helped establish the far-right AFD party as a national force. In Italy, it contributed and helped provide the political ammunition for Liga Party to move out of its northern heartlands and establish itself in towns across the south. In Hungary, we saw leader Viktor Orban link the migrant crisis to threats to Western civilization. And then in the United Kingdom, of course, the two Leave campaigns used migrant imagery to whip up a panic over immigration during the Brexit referendum. Ensuring we remain united and embracing tolerance in the face of such pressure is going to be an integral part of fighting for global justice and climate justice. But governments, policymakers, and NGOs are not yet ready for this challenge. We must plan ahead. We must resist and repel any backlash to those fleeing the consequences of this climate crisis and build coalitions between the environmental and social justice movements. And unless we take action now on climate change and ready ourselves for its consequences, I fear we could be heading for serious trouble. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. And I hope it wasn't too depressing. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Joe. So I've learned a lot from Joe, which is really exciting, but I was asked tonight to um, give us a response um, to bring some of this back into some of Data and Society's work. So I'm going to begin with a concept, agnotology. So agnotology is the study of ignorance. The concept was coined by Proctor and Boll and presented publicly through an edited volume with Scheibinger. And it attempts to really understand how ignorance is not about just not yet knowing or you know, getting to a point where there's uh, distributed inequities around knowledge. But in, uh, ignorance can actually be manufactured. And one of the original uh, articles in this agn um, about agnotology in the anthology uh, was uh, written by Naomi Oreskes and uh, Eric Conway, which of course becomes the basis of their book, uh, Merchants of Doubt. And in that, they talk about the economic interests that actually helped fuel um, the flawed science to see doubt uh, about global warming. It was called global warming at that day. In fact, one of the funniest things about the fact that we talk about is climate change is that that actually comes from a conservative American talking point. The term is actually uh, coined by uh, the US pollster, Frank Luntz, um, and he wanted to use the term climate change in order because global warming seems scary. And so this was a way of actually uh, diminishing and weakening the power of global warming was to shift it to climate change. And so we saw this moment of trying to see doubt um, and engage in these processes of of, of really manufacturing ignorance decades ago, right around climate. Um, and the undermining of science um, and terminology games, uh, or, which was really the strategy of the 1990s, um, is something that we actually saw in a variety of different domains. And I don't think it was accidental that one of the key campaigns of Russia today uh, was this um, uh, coordinated effort to say, is climate change more science fiction than science fact? Um, and a lot of you know the small print, which I, of course, didn't give myself, is just how reliable is the evidence that suggests human activity impacts on climate change? The answer isn't always clear cut. It's only possible to make a balanced judgment if you are better informed. By challenging the accepted view, uh, we reveal a side of the news that you wouldn't normally see. Because we believe that the more you question, the more you know. Right? The very act of questioning, which is really at the core of the RT campaigns, becomes a part of the self-investigation rhetorics of a lot of uh, different kinds of white nationalist and far right movements in the United States. And this is where you start to see the merging and connecting of a lot of things in the United States where we had this long trajectory of different kinds of hate orientations with tactics and strategies that were actually more of institutions in Europe. And that brings us to um, uh, Greta Thunberg. Um, and so you know, this 16-year-old activist is well known across Europe long before um, she arrived on the shores of the US. But here, thanks to our wonderful media, we don't pay attention to anybody from Europe until they actually land by water on our lands, right? Like, that's sort of how we work. Um, so you know, in August, she lands here. And all of a sudden, people are like, what is this teenager, right? And who is she? And what is she about? And how dare she come um, and start talking about the these, uh, you know, issues, um, especially the way that she would talk by basically accusing us old people of being um, the problem. Now, the fascinating thing about uh, her response in the United States, um, really even more uh, extending from what was happening to her in the US, is that the US uh, reactionaries uh, got obsessed with her, right? They really wanted to tear her down. Um, they teared her down in a way that was very classic to the US uh, frame. So um, the anonymous digital campaigns that we saw that were rarely coordinated, they didn't just mock um, her you know, campaign about climate, but they mocked her way of speaking. They mocked her autism. They mocked and dis dissected her body um, and what it meant that she showed up in a particular way. And these digital harassment campaigns really are the extension of the kinds of things that we've seen since Gamergate. And they were really sort of focused on bringing her down. Now, the the interesting thing about Thunberg is she managed to learn something that also a handful of US um, actors in this landscape had learned. One that I really think is embodied at best by the Parkland um, kids. She learned a set of uh, digital jujitsu where she could just mock back anything that they, they threw at her, right? which just, of course, infuriated her various attackers. Um, and then there were you know, these beautiful videos of like, look at all these old people making fun of her. And she would fright back and say, this is funny. And she sort of had a field day with it. But you started to see the coordination 
of that conversation in the US in a country where we don't really pay attention to climate. So all of a sudden, we're having one person coming from Europe trying to introduce and, and get people paying attention to climate, trying to motivate young people to participate. And she gets all of the treatment that we get um, when we you know, come up against the NRA in our country. So let's pause for a second, right? Here is a youthful activist who is peacefully and vocally uh, demanding for change in a way that is actually energizing youth. And the response to her is virulent hate, anger, and harassment. Right? These are the tactics that we learn from white, uh, white nationalists um, and a variety of different reactionaries. They're not, it's not really about climate denial, as, as Joe has pointed out, but it's about destabilizing who can actually serve as an information uh, mediator in this conversation. Right? Now, I think that's really important because we're seeing the weaponization of the digital targeting at the people who are trying to open up the conversation in a way that's tearing down the conversation or turning it into such a spectacle that our media will then start to cover it in spectacle mode rather than actually cover the issues at play. Now, part of what I've been intrigued by are the different kinds of groups. And I was really fascinated by Joe's layout of like, you know, who are some of the groups that are actually part of the far right navigating um, aspects of climate? Because I think a lot about who in the US are actually talking about climate and in which ways. Right? And most of the conversation amongst progressives, amongst you know, um, social justice and racial justice organizations is really taking a humanistic approach, right? Which is a theory of change rooted in the idea that we should really work on protecting as many many people as possible. We should work on building the policies necessary to not at the very least prevent um, the uh, increase of carbon, um, but also the ability to build technologies to actually pull carbon out. This is really about trying to save as many people as possible. But the US is a funny place, um, and we actually spend a lot of time contesting different people who are more interested in challenging um, these issues from a neoliberal place. And the neoliberal approach, place to, uh, neoliberal approach to climate is very simple. I'm going to save me and mine by whatever means possible, right? And that should sound like some of our elected officials. Um, and that mindset comes in with the idea of amassing wealth and protecting the people that are close to you. And, it, and I'll get back to where it comes uh, in a moment. But this is where any effort to sort of separate out between me and mine and them makes uh, it, it part of a fertile environment to have this conversation. And there's a third set of stakeholder groups that are usually not in our conversations globally, but they're really important in the United States, which is a set of evangelical Christians who are really deeply committed to the rapture um, and believe that what we're seeing are all the signs of the second coming coming closer and closer, right? Now, if you think about what the rapture looks like, um, the goal isn't to deny climate change, it's to say that it is coming and that the signs of it are very, very clear. The signs of it are massive changes in the weather, the need to hold on to Jerusalem, the need to make certain that, um, that uh, you keep out uh, uh, non-believers by building a wall, which is part of scripture, and of course, the idea that um, a heathen will be in power um, as part of the protection action two um, for allowing the rapture. And so here we get this strange convergence, right? Because we've got these extremists that we can sort of locate in the United States context as white nationalists who are really talking about this in terms of mass migration and the concerns um, about uh, trying to restrict uh, non-white people from entering into um, the US. But we're also seeing the coordination of these kinds of logics as coming up against evangelical and neoliberal logics, right? So what you have at this moment is an idea that build a wall, which is really a fence, um, which really does a signaling work within evangelical uh, communities, also does this way of saying keeping out brown people from the South, um, and it becomes a way that actually is, is creating separatism um, on multiple lenses. And that's where we see these languages that are not themselves explicitly hateful, but they do the work of tying together different ideas of hate um, with uh, extremist uh, thinking more generally, with a set of uh, more religious values or um, political beliefs. So what is, in, you know, boggling my mind as we, we work with this is that the seeding of ignorance, which is many ways was left for the news media and left for um, uh, big moneyed actors throughout the 90s, is now at a point where we're seeing a coordinated harassment campaign that is about the destabilizing of knowledge that is brought to us by some of these far right movements globally and from the different kinds of actors domestically. And that coordinated dynamic and that really weird swirl that we're all facing right now is part of where I think, you know, as Joe's articulating, like how do 
we get our hands around what's happening here because these tactics and tools that we're seeing um, come from these uh, groups are becoming more amplified and more powerful. And so that brings us back to this concept of agnotology, right? One of the things that we can do is we can look at that elephant. Um, we can make sense of its trunk, its tail, or its legs. But if we're going to address climate change, we need to think holistically about what we're seeing. Because these things are intersecting. And one of the things that Joe and I have been talking about is that there's not as much room for these groups to come together and start talking about where is climate and migration and extremism and geopolitical contestations all kind of feeding into each other. Because that is the site where we're going to see the most pain in the next couple of years as we try to actually move forward on the climate issue. And with that, I want to turn it over um, and talk a little bit with Joe. I'm going to move over to the thing, and I'm going to take my water with me. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about is your oh, thank you. Oh, you want, ooh, there we go. One, eight, that. one each, one each. One of the things I'm curious about is, you know, as you're looking at the kinds of extremist movements uh, and their response to this, where is science coming into the conversation or not? How is science being deployed, being debunked? Where is science in that conversation? That's a really, really interesting question, actually. So, um, at the kind of almost the more moderate end, for example. So, if you look at in the United Kingdom, some of the the, the kind of active climate denial organisations, the ones that will put out the supposed research that challenges the the, the skeptic, you know, creates a sceptical position. Um, these are sorts of kind of on the right of the Conservative Party. The the centre, they're very margins of the centre right. Um, the far, when we're talking about the more extreme right and the, like the far right, there's we see come across very little beyond saying the science is untrustworthy. Um, there's very little formal attempts to debunk, you know, things with graphs, etc. You might see the odd thing emerge on a Facebook group or a thing there. But I think we see far more of this, what you were talking about, Greta, and, and the attacking of the individual. This attempt is that it's, it's almost less important to argue whether or not climate change is real. It's more like, is anything true? Um, it's for it's this broader disinformation. It's about you can't trust elites, you can't trust spokespeople, or you can't trust evidence, you can't trust uh, experts. This is what the far right, this is their playing field for this. Rather than long drawn out, have you read this, have you seen that? Um, there are a few kind of key individuals you see around the world that create YouTube content and that create the sit, but they sit within the conspiracy space. Um, you know, one week these people will be producing things on 9 11 being an inside job, next week it's climate change. And that has more of that scientific element. But I think the attempts to be more rigorous in terms of to, you know, uh, d downplaying real science comes at the more moderate end of this because they're still trying to play on the, uh, you know, our turf, which is evidence and facts. A huge amount of the people to the radical and the far right, um, they don't play on that same pitch. So they don't bother, they almost don't engage. Because when I think of a lot of the debates in the 1990s, what was at stake right then was just destabilizing how scientific evidence was there, right? Because we, there was a lot of different confusions about what was going on and, you know, how much do we want to pay attention to carbon and different atmospheric issues. And, you know, the scientists were trying to work it out. And so it was very easy to feed into that and really help destabilize that if you were a moneyed actor, say, big oil that was really invested in doing it. And part of what you're highlighting here is that rather than actually continuing to see that doubt, it's not actually, it's it's allowing the climate conversation to sort of move on, but really shifting it to the point where it's about action um, and really fragmenting action. And I think about that because we're not, we might be better at coordinating around science than we ever are around co coordinating around action. So it feels like we're in a much more precarious place to respond to the destabilization of action. Do you see any light at the end of that tunnel? Yeah, I mean, I actually agree, I actually agree with you on this, right? And I think kind of an interesting parallel in terms of another conspiracy that the far right often engage with is Holocaust denial, right? Um, the days, you know, traditionally through much of the post-war period, that debate would be around, was there enough gas in the walls of a chamber to prove it? You know, they would use along those attempting to debunk the science, right? But with time, the weight of evidence became so strong other than a small margin of crackpots that would continue to go down that route, it was much more about just uh, either joking about it or downplaying its importance. Or if you now, if you look at the contemporary international far right, those traditional figures that went through attempting to debunk science and essentially debate on the mainstream play field uh, lost their influence on part of many because they died. You know, dissipated in terms of importance, and it just moved into this other space, which is just throw enough at the wall, disrupts the debate, um, just put stuff out there, put content out there, just 
to attack the person saying it, attack the scientist, attack the individual, creating this kind of uh, more chaos space, which I agree is much harder. Because if we essentially too often we end up trying to defeat these individuals by um, presuming they're going to walk onto our playing field, and we're going to turn around and say, well, here's our evidence. Where's your evidence? You know, the market. This kind of almost false notion of a marketplace of ideas. The best argument will out. But actually, of course, when we're talking about a lot of these actors on the far right internationally, um, it's not about. It's about who shouts loudest. It's not about who has the best argument. It's about who's going to create the most anger, the most upset, or get the most clicks. Who's the most articulate speaker? Um, so in terms of light at the end of the tunnel, I mean, oh, Christ. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I mean, there is a huge amount of light at the end of the tunnel. And I think, actually, if we look at the last year, there's been a huge amount of exciting developments on this. I mean, things like, you know, one might criticize elements of their activism, but things like, uh, you know, Extinction Rebellion. You know, London passed a... a a climate emergency this year. You know, so councils all over the country did in the United Kingdom. Countries around the world have started to do the same. Actually, so we can start to view elements of kind of the climate denial movement and the extreme far right as desperate acts of desperation in the face of widespread societal consensus around a lot of these issues. You know, these numbers sound staggering 22%, but they are going down. So I think there is a lot of positivity here. Um, but doesn't mean the battle's been won by, by any margin. Because I think even when society believes in these things, that's different between convincing society to take action on these things that might have economic consequences. Uh, that's, a, that's the huge next step. So in other words, you can pass a law to take climate seriously, but you can't stay in Europe. One yeah. thing or the other? Just, OK. Yeah. Um, I want to take a moment and ask questions. Who has questions uh, for Joe or for the conversation? Oh, all the way over there. Hi. Um, so I was interested in, you, you mentioned that there was this conference in Lund and that, uh, people coming from the environmental research side of things and the far right research side of things. And I wondered, it seemed, it seemed to, to me that you were talking a lot about how the right has adopted and, and incorporated environmental ideas into their strategy. But I wondered if I wondered to what degree you see environmental movements that are increasingly moving towards fascism or adopting fascist ideas. Is that something that happens? Yeah, uh, re really, really interesting. I mean, in one sense, just on the first bit, kind of, uh, there has been a core element of environmentalism throughout the whole, of the, you know, twentieth century. So, in some ways, some of that's not new. But in terms of going the other way. Um, there have been examples, right? I mean, uh, sometimes, for example, many years ago, there was real concern about things like the hunt saboteurs movement in parts of Europe that went out to disrupt hunting, um, having crossover with far right movements. The, much less, I think, than uh, one concern would be widespread kind of infiltration from the right to the environmental movement. But I'm actually more concerned about narratives being adopted. And one of the things that pops up way too often is things like population control. You know, elements of the environmental movement would talk about population control in ways that doesn't sound is pretty indistinguishable from the way the far right talk about population control. So I think we have to be really, really worried about it. And part of it is is that it's also difficult for, from our side of the argument when something like Christchurch happens, and the you know the manifesto talks about a crisis of climate and we must deal with this issue. Well, you know, I agree. Um, but that we can't just dismiss that and say, well, that's not true. The whole thing's not true. So we're fight, fighting on quite a difficult turf there. Um, so yes, I think there's certain narratives, especially around, you know, there's been uh, worrying things about immigration that you sometimes hear from elements of the climate movement or the environmental movement. Um, so those sorts of things around population control and immigration, uh, there's a real danger of them being co-opted 100%. Uh, thanks for that presentation and the commentary is really quite interesting. And so basically I just have um, an empirical question around the traditional actors that are covered in Merchants of Doubt who are um, public relations firms, scientists, the oil industry, the think tanks, right? Who had a very like well-oiled machine to kind of see doubt and uncertainty, to shift the debate, to manipulate journalists. Um, and what you show is that today uh, there's many more players, there's a social movement aspect for it, it's very international. And so is there any indication that the historical players are following these developments in order to kind of shift their own practices and rhetorics, right? Because in some ways, I imagine that they haven't vanished, right? Um, so I was just wondering if, if you've done any research uh, around those issues. 
let me know. They've definitely not not vanished. I mean, I was kind of focusing on that nexus between those two movements in terms of the far right and, and climate change. So I wasn't talking much, but I mean, they're all still there. You know, the Koch brothers are still funding everyone. You know, um, Big Oil's, the legacy of Big Oil funding still exists there, and you see it. I mean, some examples that have been interesting, there's a, a kind of online newspaper in the United Kingdom called Spiked, right, which, which has got some deeply troubling politics. Um, and that's funded by the Koch brothers. So you have seen those sorts of funding drip into those movements. Um, you do see on the flip side, of course, you see these radical right actors and far right actors talking about the information put out by those think tanks. Uh, that you'll see, you know, and there is also a crossover, you know, there's a great example in London I was pointing to, which is there's a, there's a building called Tufton Street, right, and in that building is the leading climate change denial NGO in the UK, but it's also Leave Means Leave, the, the Leave campaign, there's also kind of anti-tax groups in there, like libertarian, anti-tax, like all in one little place, it's like a forum, but in real life, so there is crossover and there is mixing. In terms of those big groups targeting kind of really extreme groups. I haven't got any evidence of that. You know, I haven't seen that they've, you know, I don't know. Um, it would be an interesting project. I've just not looked into it in a huge amount of depth. And I would say, you know, in the United States, one of the things we've started to see again is some of the tactic crossover and the place where you really see it is within the way in which media coverage has helped uh, spur on. And we certainly have seen it with the rise of some, you know, alternative media um, uh, and, you know, far right media in varying forms. So it's more that amplification as well as the policy change. So it's, you know, as has been argued by pretty much everyone, it's hard to follow all the dark money that goes through these different environments. Uh, but uh, the ability to see a lot of the evolutions of the frames and the way in which the frames uh, get purchased across a variety of different conversations, is, I think, where you start to see at least correlative connections and it's hard to figure out who's learning from who. So actually, I have a question for you. So what, you know, in the United States, our media ecosystem is different than you. We don't have any state-funded media. Um, we don't, uh, our news media ecosystem is very split between conservative um, and, um, you know, what used to be called mainstream. I have no idea what we are at, at this point. Um, and that means that the conversation around how climate is playing out or in conversation you know, it is amplified in different ways by our media. And I would say that, you know, as you were talking about the, you know, the movements and the various conversations, we can see both a positive and negative side of amplification. Um, and obviously we can talk about the tech platforms as they come across all of this. And so I'm curious how you see the actors of, of amplification, whether we're talking the news media or we're talking the platforms, playing a role in both a productive sense with regard to climate mobilization, but also a really counterproductive sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I do. Whenever I come to America, I, I can't wait to get to my hotel room and turn on your news. It's, um, it's just so alien um, and amusing. I mean, let's be honest, some of it is funny. Not intentionally funny, but it is funny. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, there is a huge difference. I mean, in some senses, you know, there can be problem with European state-run broadcasters in certain countries. You mentioned one of them. Um, but, you know, in the UK, the BBC has been relatively strong on this. You know, the idea of it being a contested issue, which is a big thing for them, is it, a, you know, should you have to have some sort of person defending the other position? Uh, climate change has moved beyond that. The, the, the you know, consensus is accepted. And that, of course, has huge ramif societal ramifications because they're not hearing this nonsense other side. Um, but we do have kind of mainstream, we almost have the flip. Our newspapers are extraordinarily partisan. And they have been hugely important for amplifying climate change denial. You know, but in some ways far more important than a lot of these far right actors we might discuss is mainstream right wing newspapers, you know, the, uh, the Daily Express, the Daily Mail, um, the Sun newspaper. These are huge newspapers that have large impact on society still, and they will publish, and they still do publish climate change denial, sometimes on their front page. And these are huge. Um, so while you might not get it on our TV, even Sky News and things wouldn't dream of kind of pumping those lines. Um, some of the newspapers still do, and they still have that huge, huge kind of impact. Um, luckily, I think, because of the kind of pervasiveness of some of the state broadcasters in Europe, once they take that responsible position to make this a non-contested issue, they amplify the, the idea, and you know, serious conversations about the climate crisis have, have been very, quite successful. But the more, the kind of the mainstream newspapers still play a major problem there, and which might sometimes sound like it's the opposite to America, I don't know. <laughs> And what about, as you're thinking about the tech platforms and the role that that's playing and rippling through? Yeah, I mean, like everything else, of course, they're destroying democracy. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, we spend a huge amount of time looking at it. Anyway, part of the research we were doing for a recent uh, magazine special we did on climate change and the, and the far right is looking at these platforms. And one of the things that's kind of really important for this, when we're talking about, for example, these people believing in more than one conspiracy or believing in a certain element of far right politics, immigration or Muslims, Facebook especially, but you know, various social medias play a central role in this. Right? What we saw quite regularly is, is an individual would join a essentially or ostensibly monocausal Facebook group that could be about climate change or climate denial. And of course you then have actors and users in that Facebook group will then link to something else, so saying, oh, have you seen this about Muslim no-go zones? Um, those kind of pathways through the movement, social media plays a hugely important role in it, and climate change is part of that. Partly because climate denial is much less toxic it's from the outside than say going into something really hard like Holocaust denial. And I think it's almost like if Facebook was like a, a bookshelf of horribleness, you start something like climate denial, and they work their way through those books, and they end up, and some people end up at climate denial, some people stop halfway, whatever. Um, so f social media plays an important role in that. And I think they've accepted that in some senses with things like vaccinations and some of the actions we've started to see around kind of fake stories around vaccinations. Um, clearly, we're a million miles away from sorting that issue out in terms of climate change, I think. Okay. Other questions? I have another question. Go for it. It's a, and it's a more general one. Um, so I really appreciated your comment, um, Joe, at the end, where you uh, acknowledge that some of the trends in the far right, of which there's many, um, can be seen as a kind of, as you put it, desperation in the face of consensus, and this is around climate change, right? Um, and I do think it's, um, when we're assessing this moment, Sometimes it does feel like everything is horrible because there's been this resurgency of uh, racism and hate in the far right. But I do think part of it is a reaction to the fact that certain kind of progressive liberal and left movements have made a lot of ground. Do you see what I'm saying? And have shifted the discourse and practices and policies, right? And here, this is a little bit of a hypothetical conceptual question. Um, but do you think framing some of the problems around the far right, whether it's around climate change or other issues as one that is a response to some of the gains um, in liberal and progressive channels is a smart tactical move or a bad tactical move. Um, yeah. So that's just a kind of very big general and maybe hard to answer question, but I'd be interested in hearing what both you think about it. It's a great, it's a great question, right? It's something that I kind of constantly think about and it depends which you catch me on. Um, I think, that of course, there is an element, um, you know, kind of like Julius Savoli used to write about, like, men amongst the ruins, right? When he's kind of come back as a philosopher for much of the right or the far right. You know, men amongst the ruins, it's like shouting into the, di you know, the dying of the light. This rage you see is, is, is kind of a sense of lost power and lost privilege, and, and so with time that will dissipate and we'll move on and we'll all be happy. I'd I hope that is the case. There is a danger to that narrative, of course, which is we uh, end up, you know, I think Angela Nagel's book on the alt-right did a lot of this, which is essentially blaming progressive movements for the backlash which is deeply unhelpful and incorrect. Um, so, but I, two positions are necessarily mutually exclusive. I think that we, some of the, one of the driving factors that is causing sort of the kind of the resurgence of the international radical right is a, is a backlash to victories. It's a backlash to victories in the rise of equality and anger at those issues, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the way to deal with that is to make concessions to that anger. So I don't think those two things, but I, but I essentially, yeah, I agree, you know. But I would, you know, hopefully some of the polling across, you know, around the world on lots of the issues we care about deeply, equality, etc., cetera, um, show that things are moving in the right direction. And I think from my perspective, I would say that there's a lot of things that have been inverted. So like, for example, take you know the evangelical community. The evangelical community used to be some of the most really passionate, environmentally centric populations. And so there's still a lot of open questions of like, how did this get perverted? And what were all of the different actors and layers doing so? And I don't think it's a backlash to progressive movements. I think that these are other forces at play you know, and other questions of globalism, just like the neoliberal politics are a much more complicated set of issues than just pure liberal or progressive politics. Um, and I would say that the same is actually true even as I see some of these intersections with um, some of the far right movements. Like, you know, 
some of the most ardent pro-choice, you know, uh, pro-environmental groups have become some of the um, radical, almost dangerous far-right groups in contemporary environments. And so we're seeing these, these twists and these boomerangs. And so I think that it's really important to not see it as a linear or a binary uh, dynamic as much as a very complex terrain, where it's like the moment you start looking at one thread, you're like, whoa, and that's a little messier. And I think that's what I would say as, as scholars, we have a responsibility to start really interrogating that and try to understand how we got there because I think that the danger as I see it is that the conversation is quickly turning into one about conservative or um, uh, progressive. It's turning into, like, so it's very binaristic. Um, and that is really worrying to me because I don't think that you actually address these problems by doubling down on polarization. And I worry that that's very much where we're going in every single direction. And so even when I take a look at, you know, what is happening, for example, within evangelical commu communities, for me, the answer is not to to just be antagonistic to those who are or deeply faithful. It's more about like, how did we get here and why are we at this point in time and where are we agreeing or disagreeing? And I am aware that we are out of time and that there are snacks and awesome uh, things. Before. But before we do, before we move everything, I wanna say a huge thank you to Joe for all the time. <laughs> So the fun thing about being social together is that you really like to do this 